Meredith Bell, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you, Laban. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Well, what is the most exciting thing about our conversation today that's been on your mind since you and I have been planning this for months and months and months? Yes. Well, you know, you and I got introduced by our wonderful, you know, colleague and friend, Joe Perrone. And Joe's hunch was right. There was just a great chemistry between us. We both are, are very focused on building strong relationships. And one of the things that I've admired about you since I met you was this whole area of courage that you have. And, uh, it, and I loved that you took on the title of the world's best courage coach, because all of that has also fed my own beliefs about myself, you know, being bolder, more courageous um, in, in terms of reaching out to people, forming relationships. And I already had a lot of that, I think, in me, but there's, you know, you can tell the measure of a good relationship, I think, when you feel that each person is contributing to each of you becoming better versions of yourself. And I always have felt that way every time you and I talk. There are nuggets I take away, and hopefully there are things that I offer to you that are also beneficial. And that's what I really look for in any relationship that I'm forming. How can I be of service to this person based on who they are and what they're doing in the world right now? Well, I really appreciate you saying that, Meredith, and I want to I want to publicly acknowledge the wonderful impact that you've had on my life and for anyone that has an opportunity to get to know Meredith and to connect with her in any way that that uh, organically comes about um, I highly highly recommend it because what what Meredith won't realize is the wonderful uh, unintended consequence of our relationship forming and how supportive she's been through this journey of mine which is not linear at all, <laughs> as I'm sure <laughs> yours hasn't been as well. So if you do get an opportunity to, to spend some time with Merida, she's a, a wonderful uh, author of multiple books, which we can talk about uh, later in the podcast, if you like. But I want to know, Meredith, where did all this start from you with regards to operating as a heart-centered individual? I think it goes back to my growing up years, really. My parents always emphasized, you know, being kind to others and being thoughtful to them. And I think giving to others is just part of my nature. But over the years, I have discovered ways to enhance that and take it to an even higher level. And I think part of it, because... I've been in business for so many years. I've worked with my two business partners for more than 30 years. And my role has been in the marketing and sales arena. And so a lot of my development of service has been looking at what happens when I'm able to really focus on that other person and think of ways that I might be able to deliver value to them and there's a dynamic that happens when you approach it with that and you don't have in the back of my mind, what am I going to get out of this? It emerges naturally from uh, the relationship. And I think it speaks to why we've had people that have worked with our company and done business with us using our software products for more than 20 years. It's because we're not transactional. I don't I don't try to just make a sale. I'm looking at how can what we offer be of value to this person or our books be of value to this person or even not our products and books at all. But what do I know? Who do I know? What resource am I aware of that might be helpful to this person who's in front of me right now? Yeah, it's so blindingly obvious now isn't it with the benefit of hindsight how powerful this is and what I've noticed just recently Meredith my as my profile starting to grow I'm I'm not having to reach out to connect with people as much certainly on you know platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook and it's mind-boggling how quickly people jump in with the sales pitch and it immediately kills any interest in wanting to do anything with them and, and I was curious to know, what, what is 
a really powerful suggestion that you can give to people to help them elicit much better outcomes in that? Oh, I've got a great idea. <laughs> because one of the things that I do naturally now that, you know, is because of years of practice. If I'm reading a book, uh, for example, Oleg uh, Konovalov, whom we both know, wrote The Vision Code. And as I read that book, there were a number of CEOs in there whose visions I just resonated with. And I thought, <clears throat> I want to know these people. I want to add them to my network. So I chose three or four of them, and I just sent a connection request saying, I just read about you in Oleg's book. I love the vision you have for your company, and I would name the company, and I would love to connect with you here. And um, so most of them, I think three out of the four, replied immediately and said yes. And then I followed up with, I would enjoy having a conversation with you to learn more about you and your current projects in case I know people or resources that might be valuable for you. I love making connections. So I'm just being honest with them. I'm not trying to sell them anything and I don't have as a hidden agenda that I'm going to sell them anything. And so I think people sense that. Uh, they sense if you have an ulterior motive <clears throat> and probably some people are jaded now because they've been hit with pitches so often, but I'll never forget uh, David Katz, the CEO of Plastic Bank, responded with, sure, let's have a conversation. Um, it sounds like fun. And so it was really interesting. His whole purpose is, you know, keeping plastic from getting into the oceans and setting up a way for people to earn money by collecting it in these poor countries. And so as I listened to him, I was so moved. First of all, one of the other things I would recommend is before you get on a call, do your homework you know, check the person's profile out. If they've been on interviews or done a, you know, a video on, on YouTube or whatever it is, feel like you get to know a little bit about them and what's important to them, because that can guide then the questions that you ask in the conversation. And what I discovered with him was that I didn't have international connections that could be valuable to him, but I asked him if he was interested in being a guest on podcasts. And when he said yes, I immediately knew half a dozen hosts that would love to have him as a guest. So I made introductions um, right away. And then I've continued to make introductions for him. And I sent him a request not long ago, because this has been probably over a year ago that I initially connected with him. And his response back when I wrote him this question was, for you, anything. You know, and it's just this thing of, I, I'm not doing anything with a, a, a string attached. It's a matter of looking at how might I make an impact with this person in being of help to them. And then I sort of trust the universe, everything works out. This person may not have anything to do with growing my business, but if I'm able to contribute to their life, that's part of my purpose. And so circling back to your question, it's looking at what can I do to contribute and be of value to this person? How can I serve first without asking? And I think that that's just you know, so important. So now another thing that I do when I reach out to someone is I'm inviting them to be a guest on my podcast to give them, you know, some visibility for the work they're doing rather than, you know, asking them to do anything for me. I think that's a key principle to operate from. Yeah. Yeah. So powerful. And, and, you know, from my own perspective, I enter it every single interaction with what value can I add this person's life? And that is the lift driver, the checkout, you know, grocery packer, the person at the other end of the help helpline for IT support, you know, to the, to the CEO of the biggest company on the planet. And I'll share a quick story about something that happened to me the other day, the, the grocery chain fries. I don't know if they have it where you're based, but it's uh, it's in in a few states in the United States, big big company, a few I think it's a couple hundred thousand employees, and I was buying some groceries, and they pride themselves on 
fresh and you know quality control and all the stuff and the stores laid out really well and and I was and I was paying for whatever I was buying and they quite often have the the grocery packers who are um they, you know this particular guy was a down syndrome guy and they have other people that have that have got special needs or whatever and I tried to tip the guy a couple of bucks right now I'm not from America but I'm in America right now and I, you know I the tipping culture for me is capitalism at, at its finest and I think it incentivizes great work and I was like and he said I'm really sorry we are not allowed to accept tips and I said why is that they said we don't know I said let me find out so I found out who the, the president of uh, Fry's was this is a huge company her name's Monica Garnes and I, I got her phone number and I called her with no agenda I just got her phone number and I called her and she picked up the phone and said Monica it's Laban Ditchburn out of New Zealand via Australia, out of Phoenix, Arizona. I'd like to, to give people an idea of where I'm calling from. And she said, hi, Lab. Like, you know, who are you? And I said, Monica, I was calling to see whether you'd like to co-create a miracle with me. And, and that was the language that I used. And she said, well, I love miracles. So what did you have in mind? And I told her about trying to buy the groceries and that they're unable to accept tips. And I said, why is that? She said, do you know what, Laban, that policy has been in place for 30 years and it's just what it is. And I said, what's your staff attrition or hiring challenges like at the moment? She said, well, in the toilet, like the rest of the industry, maybe she didn't use that word, but indicating that it's very challenging to hire staff, you know, with the great resignation. And I said, do you know, in my 13 years in recruitment leading up to this, Monica, I said, employees will feel appreciated and, and validated over a pay increase any day of the week. And then she invited me to connect with her head of uh, human resources and, uh, and whatever happens off the back of that, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. But I, and you talk about the style of authenticity and connection in, in some of your books. And to me, it was just a really powerful anecdote of, what you can do, you know, maybe in a year when I go back to Fry's and I'm back in Arizona and they're able to accept tips. And for me, that's, that's, that's the outcome that I would love to hear. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. And, you know, it just goes to show though, this whole thing of, you know, being bold, reaching out to contact someone because it didn't occur to you, would she want to hear from me? You know, it was like you're going straight to the top to the person who could change that policy if they were open to the idea. So I just think that's so cool. I think too many times we talk ourselves out of, you know, reaching out to someone because of the negative self-talk we give ourselves. And that to me is such a, a powerful gift that you bring to the world. And it makes such a difference when we get our egos out of the way and stop being concerned about what might they think of me? Will they say no? Because right now you already have a no. You know, if you're not asking, <laughs> yeah. you have a no. So why not just go ahead and ask? And anymore, Laban, I kind of look at it as a game. I have a much more lighthearted approach to reaching out and connecting with some of these executives that I'm inviting because I had recently rebranded my podcast to focus on executives who are really growing themselves, focused on their own development as well as developing other people's. So it's the podcast is Grow Strong Leaders. And so Grow Strong Leaders. Out, grow grow strong, strong Leaders available everywhere. Yes. <laughs> yes. And and so it you know, it's really neat and fun to reach out to these leaders who I've either read about, or, you know, or seen, or someone has introduced me. And that's the beauty, I think, of building relationships, because when you have this clarity about where you want to go, what it is you want to do, like when I refocused on having these kinds of executives on my podcast, when I have conversations with existing connections and I can ask them, I had one person introduce me to four different individuals. 
you know, because they clearly understood the kind of leader I was looking for. And if I had approached those folks cold, I may have gotten nowhere, but I had someone who, as Steve Hardison likes to say, who created me with that person so that I was introduced in a way that was compelling and caused them to easily say yes. Yeah, it's so wonderful. And I, and I want to go back to this power of the podcast because I've been a guest on your amazing podcast and you're the, the consummate professional, right? I've had a few people ask me uh, since I created this in, in May 2020, like, how do you how do you make money from the podcast? And when I created, I had no clue about the monetization front and back end and the other stuff, which I'm starting to learn about. But what's happened just in the last seven days, I have been invited to co-host and speak at an event in Florida in September of 2022 that has a governor, a famous movie star, Les Brown, Tom Ziegler. Like I'm sharing a stage with these people. Now, for people who haven't listened to this before, I'm not anyone famous just yet. But like that, they are all, apart from the governor, they're all previously previous guests on the podcast that came on for free. So when people say to me, how are you making money for the podcast? What dollar amount can you put on from my brand for me to be sharing and co-hosting an event that's going to have 1,200 people at it? It's ridiculous. So my question to you, Meredith, is what are some of the unintended beautiful byproducts of you and your amazing podcast? Well, I'm like you. I didn't start my podcast to make money. It was a way of being of service, additional service to others. So the underlying benefit to me has been relationships that I've been able to form, people who have been guests. Because one of the things that I think makes me unique as a host is I am I really do my homework. I spend time preparing for that guest, getting to know their material, getting to know who they are, so that my questions to them are unique to them. I don't have a list of you know, prearranged questions that I ask everybody. It's very customized. And so they sense that. They have a great experience when they're a guest. And I'm not transactional. You know, I am you know, expressing appreciation to them. I'm continuing to build the relationship. And so it's led to some amazing introductions for me that would have never happened otherwise to have additional guests on the show and people who are advocating for us, you know, our products, our materials. It, it just has been so rewarding as far as the richness of relationships that I've had people who will recommend me for another program or have invited me to be on their online event that they've put on. Things that if I had cold called, you know, or asked to be on, I probably wouldn't have gotten very far. But because I'm a known entity and, and just the introductions that I've gotten to other people, introductions to other podcasts where I've been on, it's sort of one of these snowballing things, you know, or ripple effect, where one thing leads to another leads to another. It's been fascinating to kind of look at where something started, and then all the different steps that have evolved as a result of one thing that happened. So it's, it's meeting incredible people. Now, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and have a crack at the intent behind asking questions and I think that when you ask your your guests questions you ask them because you want to know the answer absolutely that's a key part of it and also I'm looking at two things uh, besides you know helping me I'm looking at how can I bring out the brilliance of this particular guest how can I allow them to really talk about their what they're most passionate about and what they feel most strongly and know the most about that can bring value to the world and I'm thinking about my audience too what kinds of information would help them 
become the better versions of themselves. So it's, it's, I guess, threefold, really, because you're right. I love being able to learn from my guests as well. So further to that, you've had an epiphanous moment last year, as did I, when the world's best courage coach came about. What's your title, Meredith? What do people call you? The heart-centered connector. The heart-centered and- connector. Mm-hmm. And I and I want to know because my life has transformed ridiculously <laughs> in the most extraordinary way possible since I've made that declaration. Very very clear distinction. It's not from a place of ego. It's a commitment that I make to myself every single day. And you'll hear me talk about this a lot on the show. I want to know from you, Mira, how has your life changed since you've become laser focused on what it is that you do? You know. It's it's really all about the relationships. I am more, I'm quicker to say, let me introduce you to this person. I already had that as a natural thing that I do. I've just enhanced it more and more as I've become more conscious about that's who I am. And it's, it truly is centered because I care about the people that I'm introducing to each other. I think there's potentially really great impact, whether it's a guest with a host or just somebody that I think should know this person because I know individual things about them and that I anticipate they're going to have amazing synergy together. So it's helped me grow in my awareness of where can I find and seek these opportunities. And of course, Laban, when you have that spirit of bringing people together if they are givers themselves they want to reciprocate in some way it's not why i'm doing it it's just that that is one of the beautiful outcomes of focusing on bringing two different people together in a way and and by the way one of the other things that i've done even more consciously is the way i make the introductions so Again, going back to Steve Hardison and creating these individuals, I'm writing the introductions in a way that makes them almost irresistible to each other because I'm helping them connect the dots about why it's to their benefit to know this person. And so for each individual, and I do it in the one email where I'm I'm creating both of them through the way I'm making that introduction. It's very powerful to have that kind of focus on, on not just saying, here, you should know this person, you know, and, and just uh, using a sentence or two. I, I spend more time and energy thinking about how can I make this as powerful as it can possibly be? It's a great point. And I think for people that are listening that don't have a podcast, that don't have books, that don't, this is a really brilliant place to start because when you can become dialed into what it is that you do, and I'm talking about when you get introduced to someone at a barbecue or at a cocktail party or an event or whatever, and they say to you, what do you do? That's my new favorite question. Well, I say I'm the world's best courage coach. And 99% of them say, wow, what does that look like? Because I wear lots of feathers in my caps now i'm a speaker i'm a coach i'm an author i'm a podcast host i'm a husband to be like there's all these things right but if i reeled those things off when people ask me what i do you lose you lose them so it's giving people the clarity that they crave and i learned something recently meredith that blew my mind and it's that most human beings human adults unless they're experts or really passionate about it comprehend life at a second grade level that's eight years of age for those who use the other education system and if you ask me about native american history i'd be about maybe a six-year-old right and it's it's allowing people to meet to meet them where they're at and and it's given them the clarity when people say hey you need to meet laban he's the world's best courage coach it's like boom via email, via phone call, whatever. And then you got Meredith Bell, the heart center connector. Like it just gives them such wonderful clarity. And I was just keen to explore that a little bit more if you've had an opportunity to think about what I'm, what I'm sharing there. 
Well, I just thought of another example that circles back to your original question about how do you reach out to somebody on LinkedIn and not, you know, immediately pitch them. When I am a guest on a on a show, I always listen to a couple of episodes to get a feel for the host style. And one day I was listening to this one podcast and the guest just really resonated with me. I loved his message. And I looked him up and his name is Blaine Bartlett in case anyone would like to check. Blaine has a podcast called The Soul of Business. And I immediately thought, wow, he would love to meet David Katz, the fellow I mentioned earlier. So I reached out to Blaine and and just because he and I were not connected. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. And I just said, I just listened to you on this podcast. I loved your message. And I would love to connect with you. I have ideas for some guests for you. So he accepted. And then I wrote to him and mentioned David would be a perfect guest. And he said, oh, that would be great. I'd love an introduction. I hadn't asked for a conversation. I just said, here's what I would like to do for you. So I made that introduction. And then I thought of another person that would be a good guest. So I wrote him and I said, would you like me to introduce you to this person? And he said, well, how could I say no to that? And by the way, <laughs> would you like to be a guest? <laughs> so, you know, that's just an example. And he and I have formed a fabulous relationship. And he um, rec- recommended me and introduced me to David Meltzer, who has this show called Office Hours. So I've been a guest on that show, which gave me some great visibility. And then Blaine has introduced me to some other folks that are very, you know, wonderful connections. And so he and I have just stayed in touch and we really appreciate and admire each other. It started though, from me reaching out and saying, I have an idea for a guest for you. So if you know someone Or if you are a listener who's interested in getting booked on podcasts, instead of pitching yourself to a host and say, I'd like to be on your show, if you listen to some of the episodes and you find out what kind of people they like and you have folks in your network who meet that criteria, it's always a good idea to start out saying, I've got ideas for somebody who would be a great guest on your show. And then you can say, and you know, I... I would enjoy being a guest too for these reasons. So it's what you lead with, I think is really important. And it goes back to that question, how can I be of service to this person? Authors are the same way. If you have friends who've written books, authors always love to get you know, more uh, coverage, more visibility. And so thinking about how can you make introductions to podcast hosts for authors that you know, it's, it's just looking at who's in my world that I could serve and who is not in my world that I want to bring in and what might they need, what that might they be looking for that I could be of service to them. Yeah, brilliant. And you reminded me of an analogy. If you think about it from this perspective, if you're in a heterosexual relationship and you're a man, or so you're not in a relationship, but you want to be in one and you see the woman of your dreams in the street and you go up to her and you say, excuse me, I'd make a great boyfriend. Can you imagine how terrible that would go down? <laughs> right? They're going to be like, who's this chum? But if you go up to my now fiance, soon to be wife and say, excuse me, but you are stunning. And I wondered if you'd go and have a drink with, with me one time. Do you see the, the total shift in the dynamic because you are allowing them the option to say yes. You don't need to trick them or convince them. And there's nothing to me, certainly more repulsive. It's a very strong word, but it has that effect on me when people send me emails, they don't know me. And they're like, I would make a great guest on your podcast. I don't care if you're the queen of England. If you approach me like that, you just killed it for me. You just killed it for me because you're coming from a place of scarcity. And and there's something energetically about that that just doesn't resonate with me. I love, you know, the way that you go about things, Meredith, is so great. And and I know that every time if I'm able to make an introduction to you from someone that, that you know, I want to connect you with or to be a guest on the podcast, I know how much of a consummate professional you are. 
how well you look after them and how you can benefit them further just based on your previous history. And that, that to me is where the power really lies with, with this kind of mindset. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I think that anyone who's been encountering a uh, nose or has been ignored <laughs> might want to look at what am I, what am I bringing to this other person? Or am I simply in it for myself? And that, you know, this has been years in the making because there were times early on when I would get a conversation with someone and think, oh, I've got to look for an opportunity to talk about what we offer. And once I let that go and said, what I want to do here is get to know this person and set aside any thoughts of making a sale or, you know, moving them further down the road towards a sale and simply take an interest in them as a human being. And what are they dealing with right now? How can I be of, of help to them? People sense that, Laban. They can feel that um, genuineness in your interest, in the way you listen to them, how you're present with them in a conversation. And I think that that's, I'll share with you uh, a sentence from a book that changed how I operate and how I showed up in conversations. It was The Prosperous Coach by Steve Chandler and Rich Lipfin. And it was in one of Rich's chapters where he said, and this was in the context of coaches who are wanting to have conversations in order to sign up clients. Well, I'm not a professional coach. I'm not trying to sign up clients to be coached by me, but this sentence applies anywhere. And it is, how can I, it's actually a question. How can I serve this person so powerfully that they never forget our conversation for the rest of their life? Mm. Well, if we come to a conversation eager to talk about ourselves or like in an email, push ourselves, nobody's going to remember that, you know, it's delete, delete. <laughs> and the conversation will not be that enriching. But if instead we take this idea of how can I be so present with this person in a way that most people aren't, where I'm not waiting for my turn to talk, I'm asking another question that maybe is getting them to think about things in a way they haven't before or it helps them see I care about them in a way that most people don't take the time to do all of that makes you memorable and it's not because I'm trying to force myself to be a particular way it's just that I am there for them to serve to love to care about and so everything that I ask, everything that I say in response to what they tell me is coming from that place. And people feel that difference. And I think that that's where, if you want to set yourself apart and really be memorable, that's the spirit to bring to these conversations. Yeah, amen. And people won't remember what you say or what you do necessarily. They'll remember how you make them feel. And I'll give you an example of a, a really powerful moment in my life that happened about two weeks ago. I was getting a lift and it was a 10 minute ride only. And I saw the name of the lady and her name was April. And she was a, uh, a mid 50 year old Native American woman. And I jumped in the car and I didn't say hello, but I started singing this dragon song, which is a band from New Zealand. It says, Take me to the April sun in Cuba. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> she cracked up and she said, wow, you're in a great mood today. And I said, April, my life is a daily miracle. <laughs> she said, that's great. I said, uh, what, what miracles are you creating today? I don't think she would have ever been asked that question, but she couldn't think of anything. And I said, that's okay. I said, what's the miracle that you've created in your life that you're most proud of? Don't know where this came from, but it was just came to me and she said straight away, she blurted out, she said, you know what, Laban, five years ago, I reconnected with my biological father who I who left when I was a baby. And we spent five wonderful years of healing together. And 
we repaired the relationship and he passed away last year. And that's what I'm most proud of. And I was blown away by that response. And, and I said to her, congratulations, April. I said, that is extraordinary. She was a mum, and she was imparting that message to her children as well. And I, I thought, you know, here she is. She's working about 80 hours a week, you know, driving Lyft and driving Uber and doing whatever else she's doing to make ends meet. And so I just said to her, April, and I learned this from Steve Hardison at the event. I said to April, is it, have you ever hated someone that you don't know? She said, yes. I said, is it then possible that you can love someone that you don't know? And she said, absolutely. And I said, you know what? She said, what's that, Lab? And I said, I love you, April. I love you. And my goodness, she exploded into tears, right? Tears for Africa. We were embracing out the front of the, the, the car for about two minutes, but she said something to me in that embrace. She said, Laban, you have no idea how badly I needed to hear that today. And I, you know, she's a Lyft driver. There was no, she's not a CEO. She's not anyone of any significance from a business perspective, but I left that interaction le absolutely levitating. It's almost selfish how good I get to feel out of that. And, and I took that momentum into the rest of my day where I'm able to continue creating these little miracles. And, and I think it's a great example. And I'm keen to hear your thoughts, Meredith, about what you can do that's well within your control rather than worrying about having all this platform and the books and all the other stuff as well. Wow. Beautiful. That's a fabulous story. And I think it illustrates all the ways we can impact the people we encounter anytime during the day. Um, and I think I learned this years ago, again, from Steve Hardis and reading about him in Steve Chandler's books and the way he loves people as he interacts with them. And so I just started raising my awareness level. Who am I interacting with? Checking out at the grocery store is just one example where if the cashier has moved things along quickly, you know, I'll just say, thank you so much for being so efficient. And little acknowledgements like that go a long way because, you know, most people hear complaints. Um, we were, I was coordinating a field trip for bird watchers in North Carolina a month or so ago. And the gal that I've been working with at the hotel, I made a point every time I interacted with her to say, you are the best. It is such a pleasure getting to do business with you. You make it so easy because I think people are, people in positions where they're serving the public get a lot more complaints, get a lot more negative comments. This isn't right, that's not right. And so how can I bring some sunshine into the life of this person that I'm interacting with right now? Even unsolicited phone calls that I get, you know, I will wish the person well. I'll say right up front, we're not a prospect for what you're offering, so I'm not going to waste your time. But I hope you have a wonderful day and you have better luck with your next call. Just to... <laughs> Send them off in a good place, right? Because why do I need to slam the phone and be one more person that says, go away, go away? There's an opportunity there to, as you just did with April, lift someone up so they go to the next event in their life or moment or whatever it is in a better place. So how can I leave someone feeling better after my interaction with them. And by the way, this is really important for family members too. You know, we tend to take our family members for granted and looking at my husband with fresh eyes every day. In June, we will have been married 40 years. And Congratulations, take, <laughs> that's thank amazing. You. And so to take that fresh look every day, how can I show him I love him in, in different ways today. How can I learn more about him? Because even after 40 years, there's things I don't know. And so if I have that fresh, open attitude, rather than looking for the things about him that could annoy me if I chose to focus on that, you know, we all have our, <laughs> our, our habits, our 
challenges that could be seen as negative by somebody. But if I choose to appreciate everything about him, no matter what it is he has said or done, and focus on what I love and value, that has a huge impact on my thinking with everyone I encounter. And he feels that. And that I think is huge because it's our, as you alluded to earlier, our energy is what we're bringing to every situation. So how can I make sure my energy is as positive and impactful in a good way on someone else's life because of the way I'm approaching how I think about this person, how I think about this situation? Well, speaking of learning more about your husband, how do people learn more about you, Meredith Bell? Our website is growstrongleaders.com. And there they can learn more about our two books, Connect With Your Team on the Top 10 Communication Skills and uh, Peer Coaching Made Simple. Those are two companion books. We also have information about our products, our assessment tools that can be used by consultants and coaches, as well as uh, learning and development professionals. And also my podcast is there, Grow Strong Leaders Podcast. So that's the hub of everything we do. And then I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter and welcome people to connect with me there. And what concluding thoughts do you have for our amazing audience today, Meredith? You know, Thinking about all the different communication skills that we write about in our book, the one that I think all of us can continually take to a higher level is listening, where we truly want to get inside the head, inside the shoes of the person that we're speaking with. Because when we can help another person feel understood, feel valued, by listening to them and being present for them, that is one of the best gifts that we can give to others. And it's a way that, you know, with everything going on in the world right now, the way that we can have a positive impact is with those people who are in our immediate lives. And to think about how can I be a source of, you know, comfort or positive energy or help to them thinking about how can I listen to them in a way that they feel cared about and understood. That to me would be a powerful takeaway for people to look for opportunities to apply. Ladies and gentlemen, Meredith Bell. <laughs>